Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am your host, Emmy Kirshner, and on today's show, I have Danny Hughes and Valerie Sanchez, who are the founders of Divine Asset Management, and their purpose is to help women become financial power connectors that will dramatically shape the future. I had such a good time talking with them because they talked about their unusual paths into finance and how their unique holistic approach of finance transforms the stories that women frequently tell themselves and that keep them thinking that, and maybe you've said this to yourself too, you aren't good with numbers or math or that you can't possibly be great at investing. And that just isn't true. Hey, could you do me a quick favor? Take a screenshot of this podcast episode right now and post it on your Instagram and tag me and anybody else who you think could benefit from it, especially if you've been finding value. I'm so grateful for you listening. My name is Emmy Kirshner. I'm a serial entrepreneur and investor. The one thing that I get asked all the time is, how do you achieve success in business and make an impact? In each episode of the Tribe of Leaders podcast, you'll hear from entrepreneurs and visionaries who share how their leadership has changed not only their lives, but the lives of everybody around them. Hey, Danny. Hey, Valerie. I am so excited to have you on the podcast today. And not only am I really excited about hearing your story, but I want you to know that I love talking to empowered money women because I really believe there's a space for all of us to step up in our financial independence. So with that, I would love to have you share a little bit about who you are and how you got there as you started and grown Divine Asset Management. Awesome. I'll kick it off. Uh, okay. This is Danny Hughes. My background was um, in, the, I went to school for political science, which has absolutely nothing to do with money. But when I realized I either had to go back to school, to law school, or right. into some kind of degree-oriented background, I was like, you know what, I need to find myself. So I went out to California and found myself on the beach. And I was bartending and waitressing, and somebody said to me, you know, you'd be a great stockbroker. And I didn't know anything about the markets, nothing, mm -hmm. but it was intriguing to me. And from there, I realized it did not want to be a broker, but I moved back to New York and found yeah. myself on a trading desk and was a market maker for many years. And then finally grew courageous enough to start my own firm back in 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, and my intention really was to connect my clients who are institutions directly to the market and cut out all the middlemen. I wasn't the only one to think of that, but that's where Divine Capital was born. Right. Um, so I focused on institutional execution and trading and market making for a while. And then Valerie and I have known each other from the beginning of my career and always stayed in touch and always wanted to work together. And then mm -hmm. in 2014, together, we decided to start Divine Asset Management. And the reason really was because we, we saw that the other wealth management and asset management companies were not speaking to women in a way that we felt was a more holistic and future-focused way. So that's the beginning of, of Divine. Which is incredible. And Danny, I have to ask you, here you are, you're out in California and you're bartending, you're waitressing. Where did the you'd be great at as a stockbroker conversation come from? <laughs> <laughs> so that, it's funny because I was bartending at a beautiful place in downtown San Diego and it was like a wine bar and this guy used to come in quite a lot and I guess I was really good at talking to people and convincing them to try this wine or try that wine and he ran a branch of a firm that you know PS it was a boiler room operation completely but mm -hmm. I didn't know I didn't know at the time what I didn't know so when right. he said you know you'd be a great stockbroker why don't you come down and see my office and I went down and I saw all of these fantastic cars and all these guys had like these huge fat watches on. And I was like, I want that. I didn't want the guys. I wanted what they had. I was intrigued. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand what it is they were doing, being brokers and doing what they were doing. So I, I quickly understood that and realized that even though I was fascinated by finance, I did not want to be a broker. Right. That's <laughs> incredible. So did it take you like a little while to make the decision or once you were exposed to that was like, all right, this is my new path. 
Uh, I was there for about seven months. And okay. the reason that the, the path seemed opportunistic to me mm-hmm. was because I felt that there was such a conflict between being a broker because I was selling you something that's good for me, not good for you necessarily. You know, it's good for right. my pocket rather than good for your pocket. Right. But in that, I saw the, the uh, what I realized was such depth in this marketplace that mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about. And so knowing that I could go back to New York and perhaps figure out some other opportunities in the financial space was what really intrigued me because it was a whole world that was open to me that I had not even explored before. That's incredible. And Valerie, share your story. I can hardly wait to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So very similar to Danny, you know, I I got into this by accident. So I started at a trading firm as well on the trading desk. And that was because I came to New York from Chicago and mm-hmm. I needed a job. And <laughs> it was like my cousin sent me to this headhunter and that's where I wound up. So it was purely by accident. But like Danielle, when I was there and I saw all these guys with all this stuff, making all this money, I thought, wait a minute, I can do that. You know, like whatever Mm -hmm. it is they're doing and all that noise they're making, I can do that and I can make money doing it as well. Mm -hmm. So then began my journey through, you know, Wall Street where I was at one firm and, and then that turned into a second firm, which wound up being my home for about 18 years. So I went from trading to sales trading and I was more of a relationship manager and a liaison between other broker dealers that were looking to buy or sell securities in the marketplace with other broker dealers. So Danny was my client and uh, mm-hmm. we stayed in contact for many years. And mm-hmm. it, it, it was one of those things where I was, you know, one of the only girls on the desk and you're thrown into this fire and you really don't know what you don't know, but you realize quickly that it's a very lucrative field. And, and I loved it. I loved everything about it, the noise, the craziness, the chaos, mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, and I actually like thrived in that environment. (laughs) Yeah. And so I quickly fell in love with it. And I mean, it's been my lifelong career because I've been in finance since 1991 and it's been different iterations. And like Danny said, we started in 2014, the asset manager. And that's, even though, you know, I loved the other stuff, this is where I belonged. This was where the journey was taking me eventually, because now it's different. It's just, it, now it's about guiding other people and making sure that they're good and that they have their legacies intact. And before it was more about riding the wave and climbing the corporate ladder and making money and, and making a name for myself. Mm-hmm. And, and now this is just so different and we love it. We love what we do. We, we breathe this stuff, you know? So it's, right. it's been an interesting um, a journey for me for sure. That's incredible. And to me, I mean, just you know, doing a little research, checking out your website, there's a, a special energy and almost like a sense of spirituality <laughs> with how you've mixed money and how you're serving your clients. So, I mean, is that true for you? And, <laughs> and what does that look like? Yeah, that's really funny because that is exactly, you know, how I I live my life and how I work throughout this iteration of my career, because right. I just believe that when to whom much is given, much is required, right? And so this time around, because I've had a lot of ups and downs in my, mm-hmm. in my career, as well as in my personal life, in terms of my own finances, I was never immune to any of this stuff. But I realize now that I've gotten another chance. And through my experiences, I'm mm-hmm. able now to guide women better because I understand. Now I get it, you know? And so I feel like this time, not only do I have to be a good steward of my own money, but I can also help women become better stewards with their money. And so I just feel like if I keep my principles and my spirituality first, then Mm -hmm. everything else comes right behind it. And I just, I'm so in touch with that aspect of my life now that it makes this different. It's just deeper. It has more meaning. That's beautiful. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm curious too, and I think money is a place where, at least I know it felt scary to, to me to take ownership of it at times. 
and women in general have made incredible strides in you know showing up in politics and business and just as leaders in general how far mm-hmm. have we come in finance and investing yeah we've taken a big look at how powerful women really are right now mm-hmm. in the world you know it's the end of 2019 we're about to embark on a new decade all of the markets are at all time highs and if you listen yeah. to the pundits they're always talking about how the consumer is really driving this economy, both globally and specifically in America. And the consumer, the, the consumer part of the economy, part of the GDP, it makes up the biggest part of the GDP. It's about 70%. And when you think consumer, you think woman. The women are the ones who are actually making most of all mm-hmm. of the financial decisions in the home and elsewhere. We make at least 85% of the financial decisions. So we are the ones actually growing right. and running this economy, right. which is wonderful, which like pat us all on the back. It's fantastic. <laughs> but the <laughs> consumer, the consumer is the now, like it's the buying right the now. It's the impact is now. The investor side of the equation is a little bit different. When you look at who's making the investment decisions, mm-hmm. about 22 to 23% of the investment decisions are made by women. And the investment side of the equation is the future. That's what we're striving to become. That's what we're driving to build. And if right. we only participate, participating in 22% of that decision tree, then the future is going to be more of the same. So our big, hairy, audacious goal is to get to a point where women are the ones who are driving the future economy through their investment decisions now. So what that mm-hmm. looks like to me and to Val is, you know, instead of dropping bombs and building walls, we are actually feeding and educating the world. So I think that there's a- amazing strides that we've made as women, maybe a lot of times without even, you know, knowing it. Um, Mm -hmm. by running the household and by making these decisions because we live longer. But I think taking that responsibility and now stepping up into a role where we're investing for the future is really what, where we need to be. Right, right. Now, I mean, with any family, with any woman, what that looks like, what the investing looks like, I presume could be really different. But what are some just general, like top level things and how we can start taking control of and empowering ourselves to invest in the future? It's, it really starts with the, with the bare bones basics. I mean, we know all this stuff already. We just don't think that we do. You know, we hear more often from women than from men, but that we hear like, oh, my husband does that when they talk about investing or, or my dad did that, or I have a guy, you know, instead of saying, okay, look, I'm spending a lot of money on these companies. Let me see if they're public. Let me see, you know, what they're doing in the world. Are they actually investing their dollars in the health and wealth of my community and my world, or are they not? You know, so these very basic things that are, that are not hard to figure out, not hard to read up on can start driving that investment decision. And then comparing those spending decisions that we're making to the investment Mm -hmm. decisions that have either already been made for us, maybe looking at our 401ks, taking a look at some of the investment dollars that we have to work, or even when we're starting from scratch saying, okay, I really love this brand and this company's message. Let me dig a little deeper into what they're doing. And that's where you can start making your, your first steps into investment. Right. So really looking at investing and what you're investing in as a way to also align it with your core values, for instance. Exactly. Exactly. So cool. Why do you think that women are only making like 23% of that decision? I think it has a lot. Yeah, it, it has just a lot to do with how we've all been brought up. And I don't think that necessarily the younger generations have the same mindset, really. I I think that because they've come out of the 2008-2009 collapse of the system, their their eyes are much more wide open to um, Mm -hmm. investing and being responsible. But for the older generations, I think a lot of times it just wasn't accessible. The language was something that was unfamiliar. Just it was uncomfortable. And it could be left to people who could just do it for us. Not thinking about you know, this is the actual future. This is what we're living into. And these investment decisions now are mm-hmm. what create the future that we live into, create the technology, create the technology and the way that it's delivered and the people and the messaging. So I think a lot has to do with just how we're pre-programmed. And so breaking through that 
and understanding that it's not you know, if you weren't good at math, that doesn't matter. That has nothing to do with it. It really, right. really, really doesn't. If you know, you're not an algorithmic trader, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be sitting in front of a screen trading all day. Investing right. is really thinking about exactly what you touched on, which is the goals and values that you want to see in the world in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. That should be a tweetable. <laughs> okay. Let's make that a tweetable. <laughs> and, to, you know, to add to that, Emmy, I think that another part of this is when we talk about investing, that's just one piece of the puzzle because this is, it's much, it's larger than that too, you know? And right. I do feel that women are sometimes just afraid. We're afraid because we don't think we know enough, right? We're, we're of that mm -hmm. mindset sometimes that we overanalyze everything. We have to know every single detail about every single thing before we act. And yeah. that's not necessarily the case because finance world is pretty vast. And even Danny and I don't know everything about everything, right? Because you just can't. It's impossible. But I think that once we, we understand our relationship with money, and we understand the bigger picture when it comes to finances, mm -hmm. then we can get past that analysis paralysis and actually right. do something and take action, you know, because we talk about money story a lot and that's huge, you know, it's the relationship we have with money over the course of our life. And that starts with the beliefs or behaviors that you inherited from someone around you when you were growing up. And so if you're carrying around this narrative that you don't know anything about money or that you're not wealthy enough, or you can't invest because you don't have money, then that's what you're really acting on in the now. Once we change that narrative and once we change that story and we start talking about it in different terms, we realize that we can make different decisions once we really hit that point head on, once we understand it and do things to change it if it's a negative one that's been impacting mm -hmm. us. Exactly. And I hear a lot of people say, and women particularly, that they're not good with numbers or yeah. they're not good yeah. at math. And honestly, I was riding home from a retreat, um, this was several years ago, with a friend of mine who essentially acts as the CFO for you know small and medium-sized businesses. And I was saying to her, oh, I, you know, I'm not great with numbers, blah, blah, blah. It's one of the things that I, you know, I tend to let go. And she looked at me and was like, what the heck are you talking about? She's like, you're the first one to do the math to figure out, you know, who needs to do whatever to get where they want to go. And then I remembered in that conversation, like I wrote five year financials for a business plan that I was working on five years before that. And yeah. it was like such an aha moment yeah, and such a like, you know, light bulb. And I laugh every time I hear people say that because it is a money story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to stop talking to ourselves so negatively, you know? I mean, right. we, we speak to our friends so differently, right? If, if someone was talking about themselves in that manner, you'd be like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we allow ourselves to, to consistently badger ourselves, at whether it be, I'm not good with numbers or I messed that up already. You know, yeah. there's hope, I'm hopeless, I'm this and that. And those are things that eventually we start believing. So we have right. to free our mind of that and understand that we know more than we think we know. I mean, we're making all the decisions, like Danny said, and those decisions are not by accident, right? I mean, we're thoughtful, we're calculated when we're doing these things. So that can easily translate into investing and getting a hold on our finances if we allow right. it to. Absolutely. And I think that's a great place for us to start growing. Yeah. I'm just doing that. Now, you use a word that I love with a lot of your things, and that's empire building. Mm -hmm. And I know what it means for me and in my business, but I would love to hear what that means for you and how you're helping your clients build empires. Sure. Um, so empire building is the exercise of envisioning your big, beautiful life. So before we get started on the investing and the how-tos, we talk very bigger picture. And so the idea is to have women really stand in that future, really envision where they are, what they've done, what they've created, mm -hmm. and 
and then work backward, right? So when we talk about it, we do a meditation and we try to place ourselves in that place, right? So for us, we'll say we're standing on our castle balcony, we're nearing the Mm -hmm. end of our life and we're looking over that balcony. And what do you see? What is it that you have done? Have you created endowment funds? Is there some, you know, the education that you've helped build? Is there an actual physical place that you've created? For me, I want to have a home or a space where the youth can come and gather after school and have, you know, after school programs and food and mentoring, Mm -hmm. et cetera. So things in that nature. But the real work is really feeling yourself there, like understanding that this is real. If you can imagine it, you can attain it. And so then we work backward. What are the practical steps we have to take to get you from where you are right now to where you want to be? And then we start talking about the planning process. So Mm -hmm. empire building is huge, taking it, making it bigger than just putting a financial plan together. Right. Because if we can really envision it, it's different. It takes it to a whole nother level. You know, it's not just talking about rates of return. Exactly. And you know what I love about this is that you're really helping people create the vision yeah, and not just plan for retirement. Yes. That's the thing that, that whole retirement idea of like, what's your retirement number? I mean, yeah. how do you know that? <laughs> yeah. It's not a mathematical algorithm. That's the thing about, especially the speaks to women, you know, because that just detaches it from reality for me. You know, when I stand right. on my balcony, when I'm 99 years old and I look at all of the things that I have helped to bring to life and the futures that I've helped to create, mm-hmm. that's what drives me. That's what gets me all juiced up about thinking about that and investing toward that. So it's a different thing than just like a mathematical equation. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, at least, like, I don't even know when I'm going to retire. I, my retirement will probably be a very gradual thing. Mm-hmm. But I think for most people, even if they you know leave full-time work, they're not planning on sitting on the porch. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Especially not now. In, in this day and age, everybody's got a side hustle and three side gigs. And we probably won't retire at 65 or even 75. I mean, I know myself, I love the markets. I love getting involved in different deals mm-hmm. and angel investing and advising people, mentoring. Playing, women. Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff is something that Val and I know that we're going to be doing until we're like little old crotchety ladies walking down the street, you know, <laughs> there's no, yeah. you know, so retirement is different and women start businesses at twice the rate of men. So all of that entrepreneurialism is going to drive us into working and living our lives longer. Right. Absolutely. And I know for me, like my second phase starts at 83. <laughs> and I don't know why that number, but that's, wow. the, that's the one I that came that. to me. Yeah. yeah, That's great. Yeah. And I'm planning to live to 100. So you're both <laughs> welcome to come to my birthday party. At Yay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there. Yes. Save the date. <laughs> exactly. I have it all like written out for my kids and a budget set for it already. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Right. That's, that's empire. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I want to have fireworks. So like, there's got to be money for that. <laughs> so who is it that you tend to work with? Like what type of a woman do you work with the most? Uh, we work with, by the way, we work with women and men. So we work with, yeah. with families, mm-hmm. but generally on, on the, um, in the networks that we're in, they're typically women who run businesses mm-hmm. or have their own wealth, either they're inherited or otherwise. We work with women of all ages, all stripes. It doesn't matter if you're new to the game or older to the game. Okay. But where we find that we have the most impact is in that planning, is in really thinking about, like, it's not just the choice of what's your retirement number, because for many people, they're not working in a way that is a very nine to five world anyway. They're thinking much more about their legacy. They're thinking more about how they put their money to work in later generations. So um, that's not to say that we only work with wealthy people because we do work with people who are on their way to wealth. And this brings up a point I think that's really going to hit home for a lot of people who are listening, specifically women. Mm -hmm. When women hear wealth management, 
they go like, oh, I'm not wealthy. You know, and they might have like a $400,000 401k and they've got, right. you know, 40 grand in the bank and all these other assets. And they just don't think that they're wealthy enough to, to be a part of that club, so to speak. Whereas right. a guy with like two nickels to rub together be like, yeah, I need wealth management. <laughs> you know? right. So it's a, it's a different way. Um, I think just as women that we think about words and dialogue and how we want to, who we want to be. Right, um, right. But just going back to who, the question of who we work with, mm-hmm. what we know is they have to not only be willing, but they have to be ready. Yeah. So that mm-hmm. ready and willing is really where we get the most impact and the most excitement and the most opportunity. I'm sure. I'm sure. And have you met with people too who, you know, as you're going through the meditation, for instance, like they've been blown away by what comes to them and what their empire can start to look like. <laughs> yeah, we actually have. It's funny <laughs> because some people are like, I didn't even think I wanted something like that, you know? So what they think their retirement may look like when they start thinking of it in terms of you're older now and you've created all of this, you know, mm-hmm. look back on it, something completely different comes up. And I mean, we've had people in our meditations, because we do an ex- uh, something called the Wealthwise Exchange, and when we're doing that, we've had people that laugh, have people that cry. I mean, it brings up all kinds of emotions because you're just not ready for that. And we laugh because we tend to say that we're, you know, we're more of the touchy feely kind of advisors. You know, <laughs> we're not just about right. numbers. We right. really want people to get thinking because we want to guide women to emotionally connect with their financial desires. You know, like mm-hmm. not just thinking about it in terms of, all right, here's my goal. It's on a piece of paper. What does that look like? And so, and it's, and it comes in, in all different aspects. Everybody has a vision. What we have noticed though, is that for most people, the one commonality is, you know, they just want to be happy and healthy (laughs) really at the end of the day, you know, happy and healthy. That's the common denominator. And so it's a great exercise. And I really, I really uh, would love to see everyone participate in something like that. I think it's brilliant. Thank you. And I, and I've not heard of anybody, um, you know, taking people through the empire building, you know, bill but an exercise the way that you are doing it. So I think that's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. From a leadership standpoint, I mean, obviously you're doing things very differently, but from a leadership standpoint, what has been the biggest challenge for you? Well, we're not only thinking about money differently, but we also run our own business, you know? So the biggest, I think one of the biggest challenges for us is we, mm-hmm. we have so much that we want to do. And Valerie and I, I mean, we've known each other 20 plus years and we have so much on our list that we have to get really focused and we have to get really, really granular on what we want to go and take on. Um, right. So that we don't, we're not doing set because we can do lots of things at once. We are amazing multitaskers, as most of them are. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it. We're like running like sixteen different things and baking cookies at the same time, and that's just like yeah. any day. But yeah. you know, to be the most efficient business owners and build the empire that we want to build we need to get very, very specific on where we want to be, the focus, who, who do we serve? How do we serve them? And, and get to that point where we're really making sure that we're touching our clients in a way that builds their life up. So that, that focus has really been the biggest, right. w- one of the biggest challenges that I see, because I, I know that I'm called to the carpet on that stuff a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, it it gets hard. You know, it gets hard to focus like that because you have so many different irons in the fire, right? We have so much going on, you know, and we want to be out there and we want to be educating and we want to do speaking engagements Mm -hmm. and we want to be, you know, a name that people know and trust. But at the same token, doing all those things, we are still asset managers. (laughs) So we still have like a nine to five per se. And so that really has probably been one of the biggest challenges. But, you know, it's exciting. As you grow, you come up against these things. You know, those right. are the growing pains. And, and, and it's okay. We're set for 2020. We are ready and raring to go and excited mm-hmm. about what the future holds. I'm excited to guide more women to be their best enlightened financial self. You know, I mean, it's yeah. what we do. 
Well, and honestly, I'm really happy to hear you both say that, that the focus piece is the thing you're working on, the thing that you're aware of and that's challenging because I think that's true for most people mm. because they have a lot of interest. There are so many opportunities available and it's easy to get distracted and pull away from what your core mission is. Yeah. And to be really intentional is powerful. Yes. So now that everybody knows how amazing you both are and they <laughs> are super excited about how you're doing finances and money differently, how can clients work with you and where can they find you? So clients can work with us in a number of ways. We mm -hmm. do um, these events called the Wealthwise Exchange mm -hmm. and those are small intimate gatherings where we get women to come in and they're in-person events. And basically what we do is provide a safe and transparent space where we can talk about money issues, challenges, triumphs, et cetera. So that's one way. Another way is financial planning or asset mm -hmm. center management. So mm -hmm. we do financial planning. It runs the gamut depending upon what kind of, you know, how long it takes and how in-depth it is. The your pricing may vary. And asset center management, of course, we do that, and that is really a percentage of the assets under management. That's how that gets done. And they can find us on our website, www.divineassetmgt.com, or on Facebook. You can find us on Facebook, Divine Asset Management. We're on Instagram as well, divine underscore wealthwise. And LinkedIn, we are also under divine asset management, divine capital markets. So we're all okay. over social media. We Great. are, we are pretty um, active. You know, we try to post as much as we can. And of course we have Twitters as well. That one is called gather, grow, give. And of course they can call us, you know, if you call the office, you'll get Danny or myself at any given time. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. And we'll put all the links up in the show notes for that. So awesome. um, for those of you who are listening, you know, you'll be able to click on the link easily to connect. So I want to thank you both for coming on the show because this has been just incredible. And I, as I said, I love how you're doing money and, and just getting to know your stories. Thank, thank you. you. It's really it's such a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. So again, thank you. And until next time, everybody, we will see you next week. As an entrepreneur, do you ever feel isolated, like you're just grinding away and not getting to the place or reaching the goals that you want? Maybe you've realized that you just spent days, weeks, or even months trying to accomplish something only to figure out that the answer that you have would have saved you all of that time. I know I've had that experience and my clients have as well. And that's why I created the Tribe of Leaders Biz School. Get the accountability, the training, and the knowledge base in a community of like-minded people who are there to support you. Go ahead and check it out. It's thetribeofleaders.com.